In the previous video, I spoke initially about some of the rules that life must abide by. A rule we have already seen quite thoroughly broken is the rule of animals eating plants, rather than the other way around. The carnivorous plants tend to break this rule in the search for required nutrients they cannot obtain from the soil. Along the way, many species of carnivorous plants break another rule of sorts. Animals are known for a number of features, including a skeletomuscular system that allows for considerable movement. In contrast, plants have no form of muscle tissue, and apart from growth patterns, tend to be incapable of coordinated motion. However, there are quite a few interesting exceptions to this general rule, and the majority of these exceptions may be found among the carnivorous species. While pitcher plants and butterworts may employ their motionless traps to great effect, there are other sorts of traps that involve quite surprising forms of movement. So, in this second video, let us look into just how these plants manage their motions, and what sorts of ingenious mechanisms drive these often unexpected types of trap. We resume then with the genus Drosera, commonly known as sundews. This is a large genus, containing well over a hundred different species. Drosera rotundifolia was studied extensively by Charles Darwin, and these studies formed a significant portion of his book, Insectivorous Plants. The leaves of Drosera are covered in relatively large trichomes, or hairs, that are sometimes also referred to as tentacles. Each of these tentacles secretes a droplet of adhesive mucilage, giving the plant its dewy appearance and the basis of its common name. Apart from the adhesive qualities of Drosera leaves, these plants exhibit remarkable variation in overall form and growth pattern. Some are tiny little things, while others are quite large. Some overwinter in a hibernaculum of tightly clustered leaves, others wait out dry summers as underground tubers, some species have leaves shaped rather like spoons. In other species, the leaves are quite long and slender. One thing that most species in this genus share is the ability for relatively rapid movement. When an insect is snared by other sorts of adhesive plants, that is generally sufficient, and the prey is slowly digested on the leaf surface. However, in the sundews, the leaves quite often wrap around the captured insect. Drosera capensis in particular has long, narrow leaves that wrap quite distinctly around captured prey. This process may take up to several minutes, but speed varies considerably between species. The end result is generally an insect that is securely held in place as it is slowly digested. Regarding this digestive process, the sundew leaves possess glands other than those on their tentacles. These more sessile glands are involved in the absorption of digested nutrients from captured insects. The mucilage secreted by the tentacles also tends to be rather acidic, further facilitating the digestive process. The relatively rapid movements of sundews are not due to any sort of muscular system. Instead, in the case of this genus at least, it appears to be based upon a form of acid growth. That is, an acid-based loosening of the cell walls combined with the rapid intake of water to cause cells to expand. Now, one should not suppose that the acid itself is dissolving the cell walls. Acid strong enough to do that would likely dissolve the cells as well, and that is counterproductive to say the least. However, certain enzymes are active only at a properly low, acidic pH. One of these enzymes is known as expansin, and it weakens the connections between the polymers in the plant cell walls. So, if the right cells begin to rapidly expand, the overall shape of the leaf will bend and shift in a manner favorable to prey capture. One might ask what coordinates this process. The answer appears to be electrical signals, specifically action potentials. Such action potentials are commonly seen in neurons and muscle cells in animals. 
A living cell maintains different ion concentrations inside and outside of itself, and this leads to a separation of charge, typically an accumulation of negative charge on the inside of the membrane and positive charge on the outside. An action potential is the phenomenon where certain ion channels in the membrane open, leading to a temporary reversal of the positive and negative charges. This temporary reversal spreads through a cell and onward to connected cells by various mechanisms. Thus, it functions as an electrical signal. In animals, the main ions responsible for typical action potentials are sodium and potassium, though chloride also plays a lesser role. The sodium-potassium pump is a membrane protein found in most animal cells. It continually operates to maintain a high concentration of sodium outside of the cell and a high concentration of potassium inside of the cell. As positively charged sodium ions enter the cell, the overall charge on the inner surface becomes positive, while the outer surface becomes negative. This is commonly called depolarization, as it involves a loss of polarity, or separation of charges, before the polarity flips to the opposite state. Shortly thereafter, positively charged potassium ions exit the cell, restoring the positive outer charge and negative inner charge. Perhaps not surprisingly, this process is known as repolarization. In plants, it would seem that calcium ions are used instead of sodium ions. Otherwise, the phenomena are surprisingly similar. Negative chloride ions appear to exit the cells at the same time as positive calcium ions enter them, further contributing to the initial depolarization. Positive hydrogen ions may be pumped out of the cells as positive potassium ions exit them during repolarization, again heightening the overall effects. While plant systems can't quite reach the most rapid signaling seen in animal systems, there are a few cases of surprisingly quick movement. A few types of sundew, such as Drosera glanduligera, have particularly long tentacles at the edges of their leaves. These peripheral tentacles are apparently lacking in sticky droplets. When an insect walks over one of these structures, it bends quite rapidly toward the center of the leaf, effectively catapulting the prey into a field of more typical adhesive trichomes. Digestion proceeds in the standard sundew way after this. Such rapid movements are certainly not restricted to the sundews. Another plant studied by Darwin was the famous Venus flytrap, Dionysia muscipula. This famous little plant hardly requires any introduction, as its distinct traps have been the subject of numerous studies, both amateur and scientific. I would say as well that this plant, more than any other, has formed the basis of a number of fictional forms of voracious vegetation. This species is a fairly close relative to the sundews, and its distinctive traps may be derived from the sticky traps they employ. As with most carnivorous plants, these traps are based upon modified leaves. The leaf, in this case, is divided into a flattened basal region that carries out normal photosynthesis, and the distal hinged trap. This trap is in fact the actual leaf, while the flattened region is a modified petiole, or leaf stalk. The trap is divided into two lobes that are most often pigmented on their upper surfaces with anthocyanin. The edges of these lobes secrete mucilage, not altogether unlike that found on sundew traps. On the upper surface of each lobe, one can find three delicate trichomes, more or less evenly spaced. These function as the sensory components of the trap. Two of these hairs must be touched within roughly 20 seconds of each other, or else one hair must be touched in rapid succession. Otherwise, the trap does not react. This prevents unwanted closures from things like falling raindrops. An insect clambering about on the trap surface is quite likely to trigger multiple trichomes quite readily. When this occurs, the lobes close with surprising rapidity, moving in as little as a tenth of a second. At the edge of each lobe is a fringe of stiff protrusions, sometimes known as cilia. These tend to prevent the escape of all but the smallest insects. Theoretically, smaller captures wouldn't be worth the time and effort of digestion, so it is just as well that these little creatures can slip out between these cilia. 
The trap continues to close more tightly about the prey until the edges of the lobes are entirely brought together, leaving no gaps for escape. At this point, various enzymes are secreted into the resulting chamber, and the hapless insect is digested. What typically remains when the trap opens is little more than a small remnant of the original insect, which tends to blow away at the slightest errant breeze. Looking more closely at the trap mechanism, one might understand the rapid closure in terms of switching between two states. In the open state, the two lobes bend outward in a convex pattern. In the closed state, the lobes are bent inward towards one another in a concave pattern. Either state is fairly stable, while the flattened state between them is quite unstable. So, in order to close, the plant effectively switches the lobes in the trap from convex to concave. The precise mechanism of closure isn't entirely understood. It is believed that the acid growth mechanism seen in sundews is also employed here, with certain parts of the lobes rapidly expanding. This would make sense given the close relation to sundews. However, there is also the possibility of rapid transport of water out of certain cells in the trap, causing them to shrink. Overall, the mechanism might involve a combination of these two phenomena. Regardless, the signal appears to be an action potential from the sensory trichomes, similar to the electrical signals seen in sundews and other plants capable of rapid motion. It would also appear that further stimulus of these trichomes by the struggles of trapped prey causes the complete closure of the trap. Interestingly, among the digestive enzymes secreted, there appears to be a chitinase. That is, an enzyme that specializes in the breakdown of chitin, which is one of the main components of insect exoskeletons. Thus, even the hardened outer shell of an insect is at least partially digested by this particular plant. As is common with carnivorous plants, the Venus flytrap flowers are at the top of a fairly tall stalk, well away from the leaves. This makes a great deal of sense, as it would be counterproductive for insect pollinators to be trapped before they were able to carry pollen between these plants. There is one other known species of carnivorous plant with snap traps similar to those found in Dionea muscipula. This is the water wheel plant, Aldrovanda vesiculosa, not surprisingly, it is a close relative of the Venus flytrap, and the sundews by extension. However, as the common name suggests, this plant is aquatic. The traps in this plant are fundamentally similar to those of the Venus flytrap, though they are quite a bit smaller. They lack the advertising pigmentation and the cilia around the edges of the paired lobes. However, there are a number of stout bristles surrounding these traps, presumably to keep unwanted debris from causing accidental closures. The inner surfaces of the two lobes are lined with sensory hairs not unlike the trichomes on the Venus flytrap. Interestingly, despite being underwater, these small traps close with remarkable speed. They may take as little as 10 milliseconds, or one hundredth of a second, to trap the tiny aquatic invertebrates the plant tends to feed on. Overall, this plant has an unusual morphology often seen in floating aquatic plants. There are no roots. Instead, there is just a floating stem with whorls of trap leaves, much like the rosettes seen in Venus flytraps. The petioles of these leaves are somewhat swollen and contain air pockets to aid in buoyancy. When the water wheel plant blooms, the flowers emerge from the water. After a brief period, sufficient for pollination, these flowers sink back beneath the surface as the seeds develop. This plant is able to overwinter by producing specialized stems with tightly packed non-carnivorous leaves. Such structures are essentially hibernation buds, sometimes known as turians. These turians lack the usual flotation devices and sink to the bottom of whatever body of water the plant happens to be growing in. Those that fail to sink tend to either be eaten or succumb to the cold as the pond surface freezes over. When spring comes, the sunken turians become more buoyant and rise back up into the water to grow into new plants. Such aquatic specializations are also seen in members of another genus of carnivorous plants, Eutricularia. This is another large genus with over 200 documented species, 
It is also quite successful overall, as members of the genus are found on every continent apart from Antarctica. Some especially hardy species, like Utricularia intermedia, are even found in Greenland. The majority of these species are terrestrial, though many of the most impressive are aquatic. One thing that unifies both the terrestrial and aquatic species of Utricularia is their carnivorous habits and the presence of another sort of moving trap. The motions seen in this trap are quite different to those produced elsewhere. They do not rely upon rapid expansion of plant cells or other such phenomena. Indeed, these particular motions are largely passive on the part of the plant. However, the stage must effectively be set for these traps to function properly, and this is quite an active process for the plant tissues. First though, let us consider the overall forms found in this large and diverse genus of unusual plants. The species of the genus Utricularia are commonly known as bladderworts, or in other words, bladder plants. They come by this name honestly enough, as a significant feature is a series of little bladders growing from their stems. These so-called bladders are the traps employed by these plants, and they are surprisingly sophisticated. Like Aldrovanda and the corkscrew plants of the genus Genlysia, the many species of Utricularia are lacking in proper roots. At most, they have stems underground that function as roots. Broadly speaking, the bladder warts are of two types. There are those that live on land and those that live in the water, though the line between these two may often be a bit blurry. The terrestrial members of this genus have underground stems, not to be confused with roots, and it is these stems that hold the traps. These traps are perhaps a millimeter across, though they may be smaller still, approaching a fifth of a millimeter across in some species. In the aquatic bladderworts, the traps are generally quite a bit larger, reaching a little over a centimeter across in some cases. Some of these underwater species are fixed in place, growing near the shore of lakes and ponds, while others are free-floating like the water wheel plant. These have some of the most unconventional and intriguing morphologies. First, though, let us look at the terrestrial bladderworts. One example of this group is Utricularia sandersonii. It is fairly popular for indoor cultivation and is sometimes referred to as the angry bunny bladderwort because of the rather distinctive shape of its flowers. These flowers, like those of other bladderworts, have only two petals, an upper petal and a lower petal. In this species, the flower is white with traces of pink and the upper petal is forked into what vaguely resembles a pair of tiny rabbit ears. In the wild, the plant is native to South Africa where it often lives as a lithophyte, growing over bare stone. In contrast, another species, Utricularia dichotoma, favors wetlands, though it has a fair range of viable habitats. In wet soil, it typically grows more oval leaves, while submerged plants favor narrower, more pointed leaf growth. Although the aquatic bladderworts comprise maybe a fifth of the genus, they may well be the more intensely studied overall. Utricularia gibba has been the subject of in-depth genetic studies and has the distinction of being a species with one of the smallest known genomes among plants. It also appears that traps are formed in response to a lack of phosphorus, in the case of this species at least, though nitrogen levels seem to have no such effect. Utricularia macroriza is an aquatic species with the distinction of having the largest flowers among known bladderworts. As with the other aquatic members of this genus, the flowers are held above the water on stalks. Each flower is bilaterally symmetrical, with a small upper petal and a larger lower petal. In the case of Macrorhiza and many other species, these flowers are a bright yellow hue. Other colors within the genus include white and violet. Utricularia inflata is one of several aquatic bladderworts that possess specialized floats. That is, collections of modified spongy stems that are filled with air to lend buoyancy. This is seen when the plant is blooming, as the flower is held above the water by a whorl of such specialized stems just below the stalk. A population of aquatic Utricularia in full bloom on a lake can be quite a sight, particularly on a windy day. 
an expanse of isolated blooms on upright stalks bobbing tranquilly among the gentle waves. In some regards, it is quite convenient that these plants have flowers in the air, as their traps are all located underwater. Most carnivorous plants tend to produce flowers on raised stalks, so they don't end up killing their would-be pollinators. With the arrangement of Utricularia, such collateral damage is all but impossible. Enough talk of the plants for now, though. Let us consider the distinctive traps. Each bladder is flattened from side to side with a small door at one end. This door is affixed to the bladder by a hinge made of flexible plant cells. In aquatic species, the door tends to be surrounded by several large bristles. These may serve to guide smaller prey into the trap, or at least prevent larger prey from unwittingly springing the trap. In contrast, terrestrial species tend to have bladder doors enclosed within a protective sort of beak-like structure. This likely prevents the trap from being fouled with soil particles. It may also help to sequester a small amount of moisture, which is vital to the trapping mechanism. The trap itself works by an ingenious use of negative pressure. The cells lining the inside of each bladder actively pump water out of the interior and ultimately outside of the plant. The structure of the door is such that it is tightly sealed, preventing more water from entering while it is closed. This is accomplished in part by a vellum, a sort of soft membrane, extending around the opening associated with the door. The outer cells of the trap also produce mucilage, which is especially concentrated around the door, further enhancing the seal. Thus sealed, the bladder begins to compress from side to side as water is extracted from its interior. It becomes progressively thinner until it reaches the maximum pressure difference it is able to maintain. From this point, it is only a matter of waiting. The mucilage about the door contains sugars, which may easily provoke the interest of any number of small swimming invertebrates. Thus the wait might not be especially long. The door is connected directly to a few small bristles, quite distinct from the larger guide structures around the perimeter. If a small creature happens to bump into these little bristles with sufficient force, the door is shaken loose. What happens next happens in a matter of milliseconds. As the door opens inward, the pressure difference causes the bladder to rapidly and abruptly fill. The bladder walls suddenly spring outward, becoming convex rather than concave, as they draw in this sudden flow of water. The prey is swept inside with the rather abrupt influx, and the door closes almost immediately. The trapped prey is digested by the usual sorts of enzymes. Some of these may be produced by the plant itself, while others are likely produced by resident microbes. I suspect the details vary somewhat from species to species, in all honesty. In more temperate climates, the aquatic utricularia must often deal with their lakes and ponds icing over during the winter. A common method for addressing this seasonal inconvenience is seen in Utricularia vulgaris, one of the more common species. This particular bladderwort can have stems growing to over a meter in length during the warmer months. Then, as winter approaches, most of the plant simply dies off. As with the waterwheel plant, all that remains are the specialized hibernation buds known as turians. These rounded little structures sink to the bottom of the pond and wait out the winter months in a dormant state. When the warmer months return, new growth arises from these winter time capsules. It is a testimony of sorts to the adaptability of life when plants resort to carnivory to thrive in habitats that would otherwise be difficult to endure. It is quite fascinating just how far such plants will go in trapping their prey. A baffling variety of clever and sophisticated mechanisms exist that seem to defy every conventional expectation of more typical vegetation. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.